as you will see, some of the same same types that we did in the Abrahamic covenant, now here in the Mosaic covenant, and we'll see some new things also. We'll start at verse one. So on the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert Sinai, and after they had set out from Rephidim. They entered into the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord, went up to God, and the Lord called to him out of the mountain and said, "This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt. See that prologue again. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, and how I carried you out on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself." Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then all, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders to the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. And the people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So they've agreed to enter into this covenant. Now something important to, enter, to recognize here, and not to get confused on, God isn't going to enter into this covenant solely based on the fact that they are now willing to keep the law, which he's going to bring forward. These people are already God's chosen people. We've already seen salvation and grace take place. He delivered them, he redeemed them from Egypt. This is his chosen people. They are already saved, they are already redeemed. But now he wants to enter into a covenant relationship with his people. But we've already seen grace and redemption take place. So yeah, here in my notes, that God didn't redeem Israel from Egypt because of their goodness or on merit, Salvation comes purely from the grace of God. And we start to see this electing grace of God at work here in this story. And, we'll see, and we see it throughout the rest of the Bible. We'll see it before this too. But we start to see this electing grace at work here. And I have here in my notes this, this scripture. It's uh, Deuteronomy 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord our, your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the people's or on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hands of Pharaoh the king. So he's talking about, again, back to that Abraham covenant that we've already read about. So this here, in this Mosaic Covenant, is the first covenant that we now see people entering into and agreeing to terms. Prior to the giving of the conditions that we're going to read here, they go through a cleansing period. So let's read that. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them, we're at verse 10, that them today and tomorrow, have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down to the Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So redemption, salvation came first. They've agreed to enter into a covenant and now cleansing. Jesus goes into the upper room. And what did he do with the disciples? He cleansed himself. He washed the disciples' feet. He washed his feet. They washed his feet. They were cleansing before entering into this covenant. So we start to see these, these parallels. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. They are to be stoned if they do so, or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long, bat, or long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes, then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day, abstain from sexual relations, still in this purification period. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast. Excuse me. Everyone in the camp trembled, 
Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai, foot of the mount of Mount Sinai, covered with heavy smoke. You start to see this the smoke, which we saw in that first Abraham uh, covenant, because the Lord descended on it by fire. You now see the fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. We see that, that furnace um, typology, that um, imagery. And the whole mountain trembled violently as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The literal voice of God spoke with, with the people here. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way up to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach, the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up, because you yourself warned us, and have put limits around the mountain, and set it apart as holy. Here in chapter 20, he goes into and gives them the law. And you'll, this is referred to in the New Testament as the, the covenant law, the covenant book, the covenant. So when they're referring to the book of the covenant, they're speaking of the law. And that's what he goes into after this. So we see in this story here, we'll see first redemption comes, first salvation. Then the cleansing comes. The law is then given. And then, in chapter 20, he gives them the book of the law, the Ten Commandments, and after that he gives them all these ceremonial laws, which we won't go into, but we see a lot of, some more beautiful um, imagery, again, of types and shadows of the priests entering into the, um, the temple, which is at the center of the people, representing God, wanting to be at the center of our lives. We see a lot of beautiful um, typology there. So God here is establishing himself with his people. It's the first time, again, that people are now entering into the covenant and agreeing to the terms. Here, God is also establishing a theocracy, ruled by God over his people. He gives the stipulations of the covenant. He gives the terms, the Ten Commandments. And this isn't not only to enter into the covenant, but this is to stay in a covenant relationship. And this is important. God didn't give them this before so they could enter into the covenant. This is so they would stay in the covenant relationship. Here in my note, it says, the law is not the way to salvation, but it is rather a way to sanctification. The law functions as something to drive us to Christ. All right, so now we go to Hebrews 8. And we will now see this new covenant. So we've looked at a lot of symbology and types previously. Now let's go look at the new covenant. Now we first find the new covenant in the old. We first find this. This is uh, promised in several places. Um, the most prominent one that we see is probably Jeremiah 31, 31. And this is where um, Paul cites this here in, in Hebrews. Hebrews 8, we will start at start at verse 6. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator. So we now start to see Christ taking the place of the high priest and becoming the mediator. Just as Moses was the mediator, between the people and the covenant and God, now we see Christ becoming the mediator. But in fact, the ministry of Jesus has received is superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator, is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on a better promise. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, and here Paul um, cites Jeremiah, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. 
and with the people of Judah. And I will not, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. How long did the people of Israel remain faithful to that covenant? What, 40 days? You know, Moses goes up onto the mountain, is getting the law written down, he comes down, and they're already rebelling. Every 40 days ago, they had just said, everything you have said, we will do. It only took 40 days. <laughs> yeah. You know, that is the weakness of, of us here. And God is getting ready to do something completely different. And it's beautiful. I, made with, I would not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, as I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant, all these possessive pronouns he uses here, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write it on their hearts. Wonderful. Yes. The law was previously written on what? Stone. Stone. Yeah. Now, so God does not do away with the law. Paul's bringing this out here in the New Testament. Yes. He doesn't do away with it. It's still taking, it's still active, but it's being activated in a completely different way. I will put my laws in their minds, and I'll write them, not on stone, but in their hearts. Yes. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor, or say one to another, know the Lord, because all will know me. Now, some of this yes. is still futuristic. In the new kingdoms and the new earth, at that point, everybody will know the Lord. We are obviously still teaching one another at this time. From the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. Yes. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, mm -hmm. and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now, anytime there's a new covenant made, made, a ratification made, there has to be shedding of blood. Yes. Now that, of course, happened mm -hmm. with Jesus Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. He, at that point, ratified... In that upper room, he told them of the new covenant that was going to take place, that he's going to enter into with these, with us. And when that blood was shed, yes. at that point, we have now entered into a new covenant. Wonderful. Now, when we look at the word covenant in the New Testament, it comes from the Greek diatheke, which is translated into testament, as in the last will. Testament. This comes, this was translated by the Septuagint, if I'm pronouncing that right. They were a group of Hebrew scholars who were also um, Greek citizens. They translated this uh, before the time of Christ, and because there was a lot of Jews in Alexandria. So they translated the whole entire um, Old Testament that they had. Um, into Greek for all these people in Alexandria. And so that's where this translation comes from. It's from the Septuagint, um, and it's diatheke. And, it's trans and they translate it most often as testament. Now, we see that in Hebrews 9.16, and I just wanted to bring this out, because I think this is beautiful, too. We'll start at 15. For this is the reason Christ is the mediator, you can see that mediator, of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promises of eternal inheritance, now that he has died as ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, or testament, it is necessary to prove the death of one who has made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. That is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. So we see here that, again, once that once Christ was crucified for our sins, his blood was shed, we now have entered into that covenant, but that didn't take place until his crucifixion. Mm. Now, under the laws of that day, something else that's kind of found interesting, and it's a side note to this, is that under the laws of adoption of that time, that if a, a man and a woman could not have children, they wanted an heir, passed on their belongings to, to continue their name, they could adopt. Under the laws of that time, they could do so. They would adopt, 
But if by chance they had another child, another male child, after they made that adoption, the one who was adopted remains the firstborn. He has the rights to the inheritance. And of course, in other scriptures, we see that brought out, for we have been adopted. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. We have become those, those spiritual Jews. And I don't have the scriptures. I forgot to write right. it down. But there are all those types. We have been adopted. You know, we are now his <clears throat> adopted children, the spiritual Jews. Everything that is in here, the inheritance, is legally ours. take me too long. Praise the Lord. Let's pray real quick. Right. Heavenly Father, yes. we thank you for your word, yes. for the covenant relationship that you have yes. desired to enter into with us, Father. We appreciate it. We thank you again for your word for this time here that we spent with you. We yes. pray that you be with us as we go. Amen. Amen. Amen.